sorry good evening everyone welcome again to this new youtube session the topic of this session is our important ligaments of the body i'm dr ankit khandelwal mbbs ms not me an not me educator an academy platform let's start this session few points about an academy this is for the free test calendar for the month of march here we have some of the benefits of the plus subscription and this is the iconic in which we get an academy and prep letter both here we have some toppers over here from the previous exams these are special class features this are some other batches like all educator revision batch a very important high yield batch for the neat pg exams all educator revision batch this you have the subject wise test the grant test and all here you have fmg batch for the couple of months here you have the plus subscription and the iconic subscription and their different time period and the obviously the uh, prices also were there if you want to uh, get some extra discounts you can use the code dr ankit live dr ankit a n k i t l i v e live okay let me change the color actually i guess this color won't look very better this would be better now okay so the code is dr ankit live over here let's start the session session is on the important ligaments of the body what are the various ligaments in which we are going to uh, move forward see the here the, in anatomy when you say anatomy ligaments is used at various places like the most common ligaments are used between the bones connecting bones to bones that is the ligaments that is what we are going to discuss right now other other ways the ligaments are used like a double layered fold of peritoneum we call it as like a gastrosplenic ligament the linotinal ligament the falciform ligament the coronoid ligaments all those ligaments so ligaments are used there also so ligaments over here we are basically using uh, particularly the bony part which is connecting the two bones ligaments in this particular session we will be discussing mainly the important ligaments concerned for the upper and the lower limb okay because a uh, few topics over here which are which we should all know like in the previous sessions we took out the bursas and the tendinous sheaths this session we are discussing some ligaments let us start over here the first ligament that we are going to discuss is uh, around the clavicle so clavicular ligaments now <coughs> clavicle we all know is a bone of the upper limb it's a appendicular skeleton bone and it is attached at two places one medially with the sternum manubrium of the sternum and one laterally with the acromion process of the scapula so here if we try to draw clavicle over here a lateral flattened end and then it is a sinus bone over here and a quadrangular end over here this is the medial part so here the medial end it will be attached to the sternum the manubrium sternum and the lateral part is attached to the acromion process acromion process right so this is a clavicle just imagine over here now but surprisingly there is one more clavicle because imagine the sternum over here the manubrium part of it and there is one more clavicle over here that is also attached onto the other part so now what are the various ligaments which are concerned with the clavicle understand that part first of all the two joints you can understand the acromio clavicular joint and the sternoclavicular joint so they will have their own ligaments fair enough fine there is one more ligament and that ligament is connecting the two clavicles with each other that is known as interclavicular ligament so ligament a t shaped ligament will be over here so let us now write them actually the ligament that is connecting the two clavicles with each other is known as a interclavicular ligament interclavicular ligament it's a t shaped ligament which is connecting the two clavicles very important the second ligament which is present on the medial surface medial side that is in that the sternoclavicular joint and what is the bone that is lying below the clavicle or uh, just below the clavicle over here attached to the first uh, attached to the manubrium sterni is the first rib so below the clavicle you have the costal cartilage of the first rib now here is a ligament which is going from costal cartilage to the clavicle that is known as costoclavicular ligament so the second ligament over here that will be our costoclavicular ligament costoclavicular ligament very important ligament because here the weight is being transmitted over here remember always clavicle is a appendicular bone and the ribs and the sternum are the axial group of bones over here so it is via the costoclavicular ligament this ligament which is just beneath the medial end of clavicle the weight is being transmitted from appendicular to the axial skeleton very important ligament is this costoclavicular ligament the third ligament obviously that is present on the lateral side as you may be thinking of acromioclavicular joint so acromioclavicular ligament but no the point over here is there is one more projection of a scapula bone below the lateral end of clavicle or below the lateral one third of the clavicle there is a anterior projection of the scapula which which part of bone is that which part of bone is that that part of bone which you can even palpate in a deep palpation that is a coracoid process so here you have a coracoid process a coracoid process atavistic epiphysis coracoid process 
Now, between the coracoid process below and the lateral end of the clavicle above, we have a ligament which are known as coracoclavicular ligament. Which ligament? Coracoclavicular ligament. Coracoclavicular ligament. Very important ligament. Why is it very important? I'll just tell you why it is very important. Because it is for the weight transmission from scapula to clavicle. Now, this coracoclavicular ligament is divided into two parts. A medial part, which is the inverted cone, conoid, and a lateral, which is sort of quadrilateral, that is the trapezoid. As the name is trapezoid, so trapezoid. Okay. So, coracoclavicular ligament itself is, has two parts a medial conoid part, which is the inverted cone shaped, and a lateral, quadrilateral sort of shape is a trapezoid part. That is coracoclavicular ligament. Costoclavicular, interclavicular, the three major ligaments. Now, why I was saying to you the importance of this? Try to understand. Try to understand. If this is the upper limb, let me let tell you this is the head of humerus, and the humerus is going down like this. Fine. Here you have the glenoid cavity. That is a part of a scapula, lateral border and upper border, and say the medial border of the scapula. Clear? Here you have the coracoid process projecting in front. Proje projecting in front. Now, what happens is this whole weight of the upper limb is transmitted from humerus to the scapula from humerus to the scapula now as the weight is being transmitted from here to here it will ultimately reach the coracoid process also and via the acromioclavicular joint and this ligament that is a coracoclavicular ligament the weight is being uh, suspended and being transferred to the clavicle why sir we need it to transfer to clavicle the reason is that the scapula is not attached to any other bone of the axial skeleton so if the weight is going from Humerus to scapula and if it's not going anywhere further, obviously the weight could not be transmitted. So ultimately weight has to go from the scapula to clavicle because clavicle is attached to the ribs and the sternum. So this is how the weight is transmitted. That is the importance of coraco clavicle ligament. Now imagine the bone over here is the clavicle over here and the weight has been finally been transmitted over here that is going to the sternum and the first rib. Now there is one more structure that is known as costo. costo Coracoid ligament, yes, you heard it right. Costocoracoid ligament lies over here. You have a costocoracoid membrane and you have a costocoracoid ligament that is scattered throughout over here. This ligament over here, let me tell you the costocoracoid, costocoracoid membrane and ligament. The thickening will be known as a ligament. This also helps in the transmission of the weight. These are important ligaments which are around the clavicle. Repeat again. The first one is intraclavicular, which transmits the weight between the two clavicles. Remember it. Second one, if you go from uh, say proximally, first let's deal with coracoclavicular. Transmission of weight from upper limb to the clavicle. The clavicle is also bone of upper limb, but yeah, appendicular skeleton. Then from there, it reaches the middle end of the clavicle, from there to the axial skeleton, costoclavicular ligament. And between them, you have a costocoracoid ligament or the membrane. Remember these few clavicle ligaments. Let us proceed further. Now, say are some of the scapular ligaments. Apart from this, some of the scapular. Now, what are these scapular ligaments? Now, scapula is connected to two bones. Both are of appendicular skeleton. What are those two bones? Those two bones are when we have just seen the clavicle via acromioclavicular joint, and second is via the to the humerus via the shoulder joint, or you can call it as a glenohumeral or whatever joint. That is the two bones over here. Now, what are the various ligaments around the scapula? Some we have done already, like coracoclavicular. What are left over here is you have seen that there is a most superior and lateral part of the shoulder that is the acromion process. Now, between that acromion process, between the acromion process and the coracoid process, you have a ligament known as coracoacromial ligament. Yes, heard it right. Very important ligament. Remember its name. It goes from coracoid coraco to acromial coracoacromial ligament. Now, what is the use of this ligament? Remember, it is it is just above the shoulder joint. It is just above the shoulder joint. So now imagine we have this upper limb over here, and someone falls down, and falls down, or someone is lying against a table with both of his hands lying or like this against the table. The force is transmitted superiorly. Now this joint should have been dislocated because the, we know that the uh, head is very big compared to the uh, compared to the socket the ball is very big so it should though no. what is preventing this dislocation superior dislocation is mainly the presence of the coracoacromial ligament present superior it is very 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 tough ligament coracoacromial ligament the other things over here about this ligament number one is that you have a you have a bursa you have a bursa deep to it what is that bursa that bursa we discussed in the previous session subacromial bursa this is acromion so the bursa deep just uh, beneath this would be the subacromial bursa and beneath the subacromial bursa 
you have a tendon that is supraspinatus tendon so understand over here understand over here if you go from superficial to deep let me just write superficial to deep what are the various structures that you are going to see obviously apart from the skin and fascia the first stuff that you are going to see is the deltoid muscle right deltoid muscle then once you remove the deltoid muscle you will start with looking at the this ligament the coracoacromial ligament deep to this beneath this you will see the subacromial bursa sub acromial bursa and deep to this or just beneath this we will be looking at the supraspinatus tendon supraspinatus tendon tendon right so remember the square acromial ligament a very important ligament for the uh, scapula other important ligament the second important ligament concerning this is as you have the shoulder joint which is between the scapula and the humerus you have a ligament that goes from coracoid to the humerus known as coracohumeral ligament so the ligament over here will be known as coracohumeral ligament okay coraco humeral ligament understand this also supports the shoulder joint coracohumeral ligament these are apart from all those glenohumeral ligaments you have a and the ligament going from the scapula is the coracohumeral ligament right there is one more ligament third ligament uh, concerning the scapula and which ligament is that let me tell you that also that is at the superior border of the scapula now if you ever look at the superior border of the scapula over here so we border this case is a notch over here you look at the superior border of the scapula close to the coracoid process there is a notch what is this notch known as known as supra scapular notch supra scapular notch where it is present at the superior border of the scapula superior border mind you is not the spine is not the spine it is it is it, it is in front of a spine where you have this supra spine it is four sides of the superior border which has a notch supra scapular notch and this notch is called by a ligament which can be also known as a supra scapular ligament which is also part of the transverse scapular ligament so this we can call it as a supra scapular ligament this converts this notch if it ossifies if this ligament ossifies into a foramen into a foramen and then there is a question which is a very famous question there are supra scapular nerve and vessels what are there there are supra scapular nerve and supra scapular vessel or supra scapular artery you should be knowing that from where are these branches coming from so if you look at the supra scapular nerve supra scapular nerve is coming from the upper trunk of brachial plexus so remember this upper trunk of brachial plexus upra trunk and supra scapular artery is a branch of subclavian or axillary artery It's a branch of subclavian artery. So suprascapular artery is a branch of subclavian artery. Now, when this notch converts, when this uh, notch is converted into a foramen by the ligament which ossifies, then what will pass through this foramen? The nerve or the vessel? Nerve passes. So remember, N for nerve and N for notch. N for notch. It is a suprascapular nerve that will pass. Suprascapular vessels will be passing from above. The nerve will pass from this suprascapular foramen. So, but that is also very important. Then it will pass through the supraspinatus to via the spinoglenoid notch, in, uh, spinoglenoid notch into the infraspinatus fossa. Okay, so that was our few ligaments. This is a transscapular ligament. And this type transscapular ligament, over here. major ligaments like so in the clavicle and the scapula. These are some of the few of the major ligaments. Let us proceed further. We have ligaments from the elbow joint. Now, how to understand this? Take the example of elbow, knee. Ankle, interphalangeal joints, all these joints—they have a common feature. What is that? That they are technically, anatomically, known as the hinge joints. Hinge joints are where you have a movement of uh, just in one axis, either flexion or extension. So movement is in one axis, uniaxial joint, uniaxial joint. Use of this is use of this is. Look at the elbow. Elbow is the easiest one, and we are doing that elbow part. We have the humerus above. You have the radius and ulna below. three bones are over here and this is the elbow joint flexion and extension right so there has to be if there are ligaments which are supporting the joint the ligament should be present anteriorly posteriorly or medially laterally to prevent to prevent the lateral and the medial movements the ligament are present laterally collateral ligaments like we say so there are collateral ligaments over here in the wrist in the knee in the ankle because these are sort of sort of hinge joints Okay, so here also in the elbow, not much in the wrist, but in the elbow, you have the collateral ligaments. Meaning, by collateral means on both sides. So here we have. If you understand, the, my point was in the hinge joints we have collateral ligaments. So in the elbow also you will have collateral ligaments, and we have the humerus above, and radius below, and ulna below. So we have a couple of collateral ligaments like this, as simple as that. 
right radius is obviously later so it's later collateral alna is medially so medial collateral so you can call it as later collateral or lateral collateral or radial collateral better call it as a radial collateral else unnecessary cause confusion La radial collateral ligament number 1 and number 2 is the ulnar collateral ligament point where do they attach remember if you look at the humerus if i make it in this way humerus over here laterally you have this radial head and that is the radius and medially you have this ulna that will go posteriorly the oligomer process right i hope you can understand humerus it is an ulna the radial collateral ligament comes from the lower part of the lateral epicondyle and it attaches on near the annular ligament you have the annular ligament over here that is a radial collateral ligament r c and l radial collateral ligament medial collateral ligament it starts from the medial epicondyle it goes to two parts of ulna why because ulna is a major contributor of elbow joint as radius is the main contributor of the forearm bones and the wrist joint ulna is the major contributor for the elbow joint so the ulna collateral ligament will have two parts one part will go from humerus to the olecranon process and one part will go to the coronoid process these are both the process of uh, ulna only so there are two processes over here okay the medial collateral ligament now if these ligaments rupture or these if these ligaments are damaged obviously there will be undue movement on the opposite side suppose the medial uh, collateral ligament is damaged so there will be more movement on the this side only okay because this is damaged and we can move it so if this is damaged we can move it more laterally because this is now damaged it's not the medial collateral ligament is preventing the abduction the lateral collateral ligament is preventing the adduction so if this is damaged more movement on the opposite side remember that so now these are ulnar and the radial collateral ligaments now there is a muscle that can be asked which is coming from this ulnar collateral ligament mainly the anterior part and that muscle is fds the flexor digitorum superficial is also known as a sublimus muscle that is that has attachment with the ulnar collateral ligament right so these are the collateral ligaments remember they are present in hinge joints be it a knee be it ankle they have collateral ligaments let's move forward over here and the two important terms are over here which are the oblique cord and the interosseous membrane let us see them also what is oblique cord what is interosseous membrane now imagine over here that we have this as the radius upper part and the radial tuberosity and we have this huge ulna the olecranon and the coronoid process and that is the ulna below and that is the radius below it is below right radius and ulna standing this beside each other the oblique cord oblique cord is present from the coronoid process just distal to the radial tuberosity this is the place of oblique cord oblique cord understand o dot c it is arising from the coronoid process of the ulna to where just distal to the radial tuberosity just distal to the radial tuberosity we have the oblique cord okay we have the oblique cord very important why we'll just see second is the interosseous membrane now interosseous membrane is present between the radius and the ulna but what is the direction what is the direction of this interosseous membrane it is from radius to ulna but is it horizontal is it going down is it going above where it is going remember it is going down from radius to ulna this is the interosseous membrane this is the interosseous membrane and if you look at the classification of the joints they will come as a part of syndesmosis so interosseous membrane remember interosseous membrane goes from radius to ulna and down in a downward direction downward direction now if this point i cover up over here that interosseous membrane is going from radius to ulna and if you know the idea that the development of the upper and the lower limb they go nearly hand by hand they are nearly same so what would be the direction of interosseous membrane in case of leg that is between tibia and fibula will it be tibia to fibula will it be fibula to tibia what would, what would be the direction the direction would be from pre axial bone to the post axial bone that is in the leg it would be from tibia to fibula tibia to fibula remember in the downward direction same so remember that part so interosseous membrane is present over here present over here and uh, oblique cord actually oblique cord is said to be degenerated part of the biceps tendon that is also said but come to the interosseous membrane that is actually more important and what is this interosseous membrane giving rise to what is the importance of this is there are few important parts for the or the important functions or actions of the interosseous membrane where we have to understand that so if i write i o m over here first of all as you can see that it is binding the two bones so obviously 
it is uh, increasing the surface area for the attachment of the muscles so interosseous membrane will increase the surface area for attachment of the muscles fine now sir which muscles obviously the deep muscles which muscles obviously the deep muscles not the superficial both anteriorly as well as posteriorly anteriorly means the in the front part so what are the deep muscles in the front part that i guess you know there are three main muscles in the front part which are deep and what are those flexor digitorum profundus flexor pollicis longus pronator quadratus okay and so what about the posterior part yes posterior part also we should be knowing posterior part that is the extensor part the outcropping muscles we call them as the outcropping muscles because their tendons they outcrop and they go towards the lateral side into the pollex of the thumb what are those i hope you got the point by now abductor pollicis longus extensor pollicis brevis extensor pollicis longus these are the main what else would lie on the interosseous membrane apart from increasing the surface area what else lies on the interosseous membrane obviously the deep nerve and vessels what are the deep nerve and vessels we should be knowing that the nerves which are lying deep anteriorly we have the anterior interosseous nerve and vessels okay and obviously posteriorly we have the posterior interosseous nerve and obviously some of the vessels these would also lie in the interosseous membrane now comes a point the does any structure will pierce this interosseous membrane if yes which structure does any structure pierce this interosseous membrane if yes where and which structure now understand that we had a we had a brachial artery over here that divided into radial and ulnar artery if you remember brachial artery mdbr median nerve brachial artery biceps tendon radial nerve so we had a big brachial artery over here divided into radial and ulnar artery ulnar artery divided into a common interosseous and then proceeded down common interosseous divided into anterior and posterior interosseous okay now you may think that sir posterior interosseous should pierce the interosseous membrane the answer is no posterior interosseous vessel pass between the oblique cord and the interosseous membrane right somewhat around over here or over here so posterior interosseous vessel or artery is not per, is not uh, piercing or perforating the interosseous membrane then what happens then the anterior interosseous vessel will be running over here but the posterior interosseous vessel is very small just going around over here it ends somewhat in the middle of the forearm in the posterior aspect but the anterior interosseous artery is running down and as, as it goes down it sees a muscle over here which is which is which is that band shaped muscle deep muscle lying over here which is that band shaped muscle that causes pronation and it is present anteriorly which is the deep muscle present anteriorly pronator quadratus so just as this anterior interosseous artery reaches proximal to pronator quadratus it will pierce this membrane and then it will go posteriorly so it is the which structure is piercing the interosseous membrane the answer is anterior interosseous artery or vessels you can say okay it will pierce and then it will go posteriorly then it will go posteriorly so interosseous membrane look at the direction what are the various, various muscles attached over there and what are the structures which are piercing this and what is the use of other use of this apart from increasing surface area what is the other use of it very important use what i told you is that distally if you look that suppose this is the elbow i'm just citing elbow imagine it to be the elbow that is the wrist imagine it to be the wrist and this is below the wrist you have the hand and that is the forearm fine fair enough elbow elbow we can also write the arm over here now see what happens is when the weight is transmitted from hand to wrist into the forearm it is basically the radius bone which will receive the weight because radius bone is a major part of wrist joint not the ulna ulna does not actually participate in the wrist joint so now the weight has been transmitted to radius now in the forearm it is via the interosseous membrane why what why interosseous membrane that is weight is transmitted to the ulna why is it ulna because now ulna will play a major role at the region of elbow humeral ulna joint a major so this is how the weight is transmitted via interosseous membrane from ulna via elbow into the arm and then arm you know The scapula, and I told you the coracoclavicular, the costoclavicular, then the sternum, the ribs, vertebrae, hip bone, ball and socket, hip joint, lower limb, knee, leg, and foot. This is how the weight is actually being transmitted. This is another role of the interosseous membrane over here in the forearm. Same way, what the interosseous membrane is going to provide in case of leg. Okay, so this these are few attachments of the interosseous membrane. 
and oblique cord. Oblique cord is also very important and it helps to, you know, uh, attachment of some of the muscles, some of the muscles over here, like the FPL would be attached to the oblique cord and thus. Okay, so guys, so this was in a brief some of the ligaments of the upper limb which I wanted to enlighten over here. We will take another session of the ligaments of the lower limb in which very important ligaments are there. Actually, more important because that part of the body is pretty much bigger compared to the upper limb, the hip and the knee joint and the ankle ligaments. They are very important. We will cover it in some other session. I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, that's all. Thank you from my side and uh, all the best.